in a coffee shop, in a city, which is every coffee shop, in every city, on a day, which is every day. Hello, friends, and welcome to the 33rd episode of Barista Unfiltered, a podcast dedicated to the life and times of baristas. They tell us what's brewing in their lives and work in this free-flowing and unfiltered podcast. I'm Jody Lee. And I'm Austin Miller. And we are so happy you're with us today. Our guest is Mary DeLorenzo Woods, and that sounds super fancy. You gotta love a person with a hyphenated name. It denotes like greatness. And she is great, even though I don't know her. Austin knows her, and anyone Austin vouches for, I know must be fabulous. She's a barista who works um, she's been working on and off as a barista for like 12 years, and she still does that for money. But on the side, she's got this business as a folk herbalist. We're going to learn all about that and her barista skills. She's currently living in Sherman Oaks, but I think people in the biz out there just say they live in L.A. when they get that close. So <laughs> she's working in Venice, and we just can't wait to hear more about her. So welcome to the podcast, Mary, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Jody and Austin. I'm so happy to be here. So just to say, Mary is uh, not only a former co-worker of mine, but also consider her a very dear friend. And Mary, we're really excited to be able to talk to you today. Yay, I'm so excited. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. And you're definitely bringing in a California look with that backyard. Yeah. Anybody who happens to watch <laughs> this is going to be jealous. <laughs> And you know what? A little a little wind just kicked up to keep things interesting. So if you hear some sounds in the background, there's a little little Santa Ana going on. <clears throat> so um, so Mary, I'm wondering is uh, our job that we had together at Coffee to the People, which um, just so everyone out there knows, Coffee to the People was about a block off of the famous intersection of Haight and Ashbury and uh, the Haight Ashbury neighborhood of uh, San Francisco. Uh, Mary and I worked there starting in 2007 together, and I was wondering, is that was that your first coffee gig that you ever worked? It was my first coffee gig. It was my very first, and what an incredible, incredible experience to be my first coffee gig. And you were, what, like 20 when you started there? I was actually 19. I, I turned 20 a few months in, but I started off 19 years old, just moved to San Francisco, and it was my first coffee job. And had you been drawn to doing coffee for a long time, or did you, was it just sort of a job that you stumbled into? I really just stumbled into it. Um, I've always loved coffee. Um, I started drinking coffee probably when I was 14 or so, and I am Italian, which I'm sure I'll talk about way too much on the podcast. Um, but So I have a background in coffee. My family loves coffee. It's part of our embedded daily culture. Um, I wouldn't say I was looking to find coffee, but it found me. And um, mainly, I had just moved to the city, and I was looking for a job. And um, I had moved to the Coal Valley, which is a neighborhood pretty much sandwiched with the Haight-Ashbury. It's almost one and the same of a neighborhood. But um, I needed a job, and I was going to scan the Haight. It seemed like a logical thing to do was scan the busy, crazy street right next to me and find a job. And um, I just thought... At first, I thought retail. My background so far in life had been in retail. And then I saw Coffee of the People, and I'm like, why not just check it out and see, do an interview? And um, and I did. And that's how I landed in coffee. So it was more the neighborhood I was looking in rather than the position or the job. And Mary was one of um, a whole group of just really exceptional women that started the shop. I was one of the few men, actually, that worked there. At the time, um, the the owner and manager was a woman, and she had mostly a staff of really strong women. And I felt very fortunate to, <laughs> to work with this crew, even though I was. It was funny because I was the the manager, and I felt like uh, I felt like sometimes I felt like one of you guys should be one of the managers instead of myself. Um, although I was older and Where, I loved. Did you did you call yourself the low manager? Uh, yeah, I should, probably should have. <laughs> I didn't start off actually in that position. Um, it was Megan, right? That that first hired. Did she hire you as well, Mary? Yeah, she hired me as well. And um, I have to say though that none of us, as really strong, wild women, ever didn't want Austin to be the manager. Austin <laughs> was definitely the person that needed to be the manager. We were like the the wild women holding it down but Austin was our was our man was our manager for sure that that kept things in order from getting a little too out there 
And the only, you know, the only like justification I can have for that is that I was in my 30s and all you guys yes. were like yes. 20. Well, yeah. most of you guys were, yeah. you know, in your we early were, We all had 20s. much less experience and we were all young and way too wild to be a manager of anything but our own our own lives. <laughs> but you know, I have to say that you all held it together so much better than I did at that age. <laughs> so, so, so I, I really didn't have much room to get frustrated with anybody because I would look at the, I would look at, at this group of people and I really felt like you guys were holding it down because you were living your life. You were amazing and you were still able to get up and, and put on a yeah. good face and work hard. Um, yeah, I know it's true. We, it's true. So um, did you did you know how to make coffee when you got this job or did did you learn on the job? Um, I didn't, but um, I'm the kind of person, Jody, even at 19 years old, where I, I know I'm smart, I'm quick, I'm fast, I'm sharp. And I knew I told them, like, look, if you hire me, I don't know how to make coffee right now, but I love coffee. I have good taste and I will quickly learn how to make coffee. And that's honestly what I did. I went in there and um, and I learned and. Um, to this day, I'm still learning, which I'm sure we'll get into later, but you never stop learning as a barista and you have good days and you have days where you're just not good or you feel like you can't steam or you're just not in your flow and you have other days where you're killing it. So I had no experience, but I learned quickly and we were just such an incredible team, which I'm sure this interview will be talking a lot about coffee to the people, but it, it made it easy to just do well and, and, um, just do a good job. What do you... Up. What did you What did you feel like was the best part for you of working at Coffees the People? Oh God! Um, well, by far the staff, my my coworkers, was my favorite part. There's kind of two parts to that, but um, you know, as Austin just mentioned, we we were and are to this day a family, and showing up to work every day. Like there were days where of course, you know, some of us would want to rip each other's heads off or, <laughs> or, you know, we're like our family. So things would be like that. But, um, but in general, just showing up every day, knowing you're going to be with a different character because it was just a cast of amazing eccentric characters. And just knowing you were going to show up that day and what was it going to be like? Maybe it was going to be like, Oh, I'm working with so-and-so today. It's going to be a trip, you know, <laughs> it's going to be fun or it's going to, I'm working with so-and-so today. It's going to be this kind of energy and just knowing that no matter who you were working with, and I can honestly say this about everybody, it was just, it was just showing up and being comfortable, knowing that you were like being at coffee to the people was being home, going and knowing that you felt good. You felt like it was your turf and it just felt, felt safe and felt comfortable. And I'm sure Austin agrees um, I do. Yeah. Um, although I will, I have to point out right now, um, cause I always want to like remind you about this and, and you probably don't even remember it. It was a conversation you and I had. Um, it was towards <laughs> the end of the coffee to the people time. And it was real clear, um, that it was coming to a cl close. Um, there was like several like longtime people that were going, leaving and, you know, the coffee shop had been sold and things were just changing yeah. really fast. And you could kind of feel the sense really shifting at, at a certain moment we knew that like, you know, the, the months were numbered. Um, and, uh, and I remember having a conversation with you like by the dishwasher and you said something along the lines of, um, you know, we were all going to be friends forever. And I, I think I was tired and I think I was jaded like um, towards the end of that period, because it was really challenging, like kind of navigating as a manager, um, the change of uh, ownership and all that kind of stuff. So by the, by the end of it, I was pretty exhausted. And, um, and in my jaded mind, I was like, yeah, life will move on. You were about to have a baby. I was like, I was like, you may think that we're all going to like know each other forever, but your life's going to move on and we're all going to forget all about each other. That's where I was honestly at that mm -hmm. point. And, mm -hmm. um, and you were like, no, no, that's not going to happen. And I'm glad you were right. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Honestly, like I'm going to cry right now. Um, yeah, no, I knew, I knew that we were going to be a family forever. And like Jody, um, Austin, as well as most of, um, the copy, the people folks were at my wedding, which was five years ago. I mean, these are people like, we're not just like, Oh, I used to work with that person, you know? And I knew then like, and it doesn't mean that it was always great. I mean, we all had bad days. We all had days where we hated the place, but it was just like, we were a tight, tight community. And the other half of my answer to what I loved best was just the underbelly of the community of the hate, which, um, again, Austin knows is, was just something so magical and special. And especially at that time. And 
I've had a lot of people concur that that time, like between 2007, 2010, was a really special time in the hate. And um, I don't know, like the community, just seeing those faces every day, they're not being able to really put a label on what kind of person lived in the hate or worked in the hate or was part of that community. It was like everybody you can think of. And that's what made it so special. There was no like trendy sort of little like label you could slap on the kind of person that was part of the hate. It was such an eclectic mix. And um, I mean, some of the customers, for example, I have to give a shout out to Buster. Um, Buster is a 75 year old man who's been in the hate and just been like pretty much the mayor of the hate unofficially since the sixties, um, lives at hate in Ashbury and just seeing his face every single morning at 6am when we opened our doors and just that, um, that grounding and that ritual of like seeing Buster and giving him his, his 12 ounce coffee. And to this day, him and I still write letters to each other. And I send him a Christmas card of my children every single holiday. Um, but just that, just that sense of, of belonging and community and just amazing cast of characters. And it's just, it's a time I treasure in my heart forever. And I, I honestly think about the hate and coffee to the people, like probably almost every single day. If for some reason or another, something flashes through my head and it's just, it's part of me. It's part of me forever. And I'm glad that Austin, that it was true. And I knew that I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I think one really special thing that we got to experience there too, is that, you know, the hate Ashbury has long since moved on from the summer of love and it's, you know, mostly like a shopping retail district now and a lot of changes have hit the neighborhood, but we were lucky enough to be there. And I think we were all, you know, all of us were to some extent brought there from the history and wanting to somehow connect with that history that happened in the hate Ashbury, even though we were all well aware that it was, you know, long since passed, we just wanted to somehow experience it and um yeah. and so i think there was a lot of the people around that like buster and like uh there was a woman named alice rules that was a customer there that um that could tell the stories from those and days Kat and, and richard we have to give a shout out to this wonderful hippie couple cat and richard who are magical and amazing came in every day where are they all... drinking coffee now that's a good question. I, you know, I don't know if uh, how much of the community still goes there. The place is still open. Coffee oh, of the People okay. is still there, believe it or not. But um, it's under a different ownership, and um, and it was sold to. I would love to to. There was a woman named Eve who bought the business, and uh, she was, I think, in her own way, an exceptionally strong and amazing woman. Um, where there was conflicts because because. That family bought it from the people who originally started it. They they were very idealistic. They wanted to do everything right by us. They wanted to give us health insurance. They wanted to give us like all these rights as workers. They basically kind of ran it almost like a co-op. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, the the business model wasn't working, um, and they weren't they weren't making money, and they sold the business. Um, it was kind of a shocker for everybody. But the family that bought it was a Cambodian family that I think owned like several different cafes and it was run um, by this woman named Eve um, who had a hell of a story getting out of Cambodia. And, you know, there were, there was problems because I think like towards the end of that three year period, they had it in the contract to, to kind of move us all along and take it on as a family business. Um, and so that, that was a painful period because we had all put our heart and soul in that. And then we were kind of being excused. Our services were no longer needed. Um, and that was rough. Yeah. Um, but I, I, would, yeah. I, I did, you know, I learned a lot from Eve and she, she really, you know, she really worked hard and she did it for yeah. her son. A lot of it, she yeah. did for her son. She had a disabled son that, um, that she, uh, that she loved very deeply. And, um, and she all would always say like, I do all this for my son, everything. Do you remember? Yeah. And he passed away while we worked there. Yes. And that was really heavy to have to see. Yeah, it was a lot. There was a lot of layers and things we saw and witnessed together. And yeah, she was an amazing woman. Yeah, we butted heads because especially the baristas, we were young and we were we were just didn't, you know, we felt like our shop was kind of being taken away from us. And it really it, it wasn't. It was just the ownership was kind of a shock, the change. And um, and she was she was the bottom line. is She, she is an amazing woman. And you know, yeah, she's strong and she did love us. I know that she did love us. And I really see that now when I think about it, like she, we weren't just disposable to her. Like she valued us to, to a certain extent. And 
you know, all great things have to come to an end. I feel privileged because I, I didn't have to see what Austin saw, like as the coffee shop was kind of unraveling and everyone was leaving one by one and new people were coming and it just was losing it. And I kind of left because I was going to have my baby while everybody was still there. And I kind of excused myself probably first and didn't really have to see all that. I think as dramatic as it sounds, it would have been really painful to see that because we were once such a strong, vibrant, like, entity that was so alive in the community and I would have hated to see that but I know that it kind of unraveled after one by one as after I left Um, but for the better I think for the better you know we all we all went on to the next stage of our life and and it was what needed to happen um Mm -hmm. as hard as it was it was hard to let go but we but we we gave it our all and we we made like a really great point in time you know for four years that was a pretty solid stuff it was solid and it was, yeah, it was beautiful. <laughs> um, so what would you say, like, if you had to say what was the, one of the most challenging parts of getting up in the morning and going to work there? Like what, what really like rocks your boat? Um, okay. Well, there's definitely a, an answer there. <laughs> um, well, getting up obviously at, at what, 4.30 sometimes, especially for a year old young woman that's, you know, going out at night doing God knows what. Um, oh, we know. So there's that. There's that. Oh, we <laughs> know. But, uh, <laughs> but the thing is, is um, there was something in getting up that early in the dark and having to make my way from my apartment to uh, Coffee to the People, and it was dark and it was Hate Street, and it obviously was a little bit shady feeling sometimes. But um, there was just a kind of a sense of empowerment. As much as I would sometimes hate doing that walk, it was like. It was like, I'm 20 and I'm a woman and I'm walking down the street and I'm, and I've got this. And I felt like maybe this sounds naive, but I I felt safe in my neighborhood as shady as it could be. And I felt good there. Um, and there, I have to say there was also a lot of times that my boyfriend who spent also a lot of time at coffee to the people now husband would often, uh, walk me to work and skate home in the morning, which is super sweet. Um, but I also loved walking there in the early mornings and, um, you know, so yeah, that part was hard, but, but. I enjoyed enjoyed it mostly. But the one gripe I had, um, there's a lot of transient folks on Hate Street. And and some of them can get, you know, volatile or, you know, naturally. And I think we got really graded. Like sometimes we would show up at five in the morning. Mary. Mary, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you pause for a second. There's something going on with the sound right now. Um, I don't know if something's covering up your mic or what. Can you hear me? That's, That's much better. Perfect. Okay, yes. there was a leaf. There was <laughs> there was a leaf on my microphone. Um, I just don't did, want you did... to say anything awesome and then miss it. So no, that's okay. To... Is there anything you want me to repeat? You're perfect. Okay. So, um, so um, you were talking so getting about to work transient. at 5 a.m., um, opening your doors, and then you're literally having to step over a body of somebody that's passed out in front of the door. Um, as compassionate as you are as a human, which we all are, the people that work there, I could say we're all compassionate humans. Like that just got real old, um, having to walk over people that are passed out. Um, and also the, the going in in the morning and the people coming in all day long, wanting to use the bathroom, being in there for an hour as much as we tried to regulate or there was, there was definitely some wild stuff and not in a good way that went on. Um, you know, Oh, look, there's a guy on the couch over there and his pants are down. Um, he's got his hands in his pants and like, how are we going to deal with this? Austin? Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. We had Um, to deal with some interesting, I mean, when you say, when you say that, that, you know, every coffee shop, people say you have to deal with interesting characters, but I have to say out of everywhere I've worked, some of the situations we had to deal with there, you know, um, it was definitely above our pay grade, but I think we all got like really good life experience from it. Yes. Yes. And I have to say like some of the folks, some of the transient folks were amazing and we'd meet them and they would, we would love to talk to them and hear their stories and have them sit down and take a book off our community shelf or play their guitar or do whatever. And, and there were some folks that were awesome, but there was a lot of folks that were just uh, disconnected and, um, sadly, you know, just, I don't know, not pretty volatile and we didn't enjoy having them in the coffee shop. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I definitely learned like, like the, the, I would agree with you that that was the most challenging part. Um, and also coming from both sides, because you had, 
you know, you had a rather affluent community that lived in in the Haight Ashbury as well. That they weren't necessarily there for the hippie days. They were there because you know they got a a home in a desirable city and a in a nice neighborhood. And so they're you know they were definitely at loggerheads with a lot of the transient community. And we were kind of stuck in the middle because we weren't the wealthy. We also weren't the transients, but we were kind of like dealing with um, both ends because the. Yeah. A lot of times people will come complain about the transients, expect us to do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so we were, you know, we were having to deal with that um, from both ends. And I think we had to learn um, how to deal with each person as an individual and challenge our own assumptions and not jump to any conclusions about anybody yeah. and deal with each situation with each person as novel. And not, and because if you if you went in and you prejudge someone then you then you ended up in a heated conflict. Yes, yes. And that's and I have what to say, you want to avoid. Every time I prejudge someone, I can tell you, almost every time I prejudge someone, I was taught my lesson, my lesson from the divine, that they were a beautiful human being and that I was being an asshole, to be honest. <laughs> um, or, you know, I mean, I have to be honest that I think I got a little bit jaded, to use that word again, um, and I was so maybe sick of dealing with people full-time every day or transient people that I look back sometimes and I, I I, don't like that about myself, kind of remembering like, oh, God, I just, you know, just thinking about maybe certain transient people stick out of my mind or maybe certain days I was just over it, and I, and I, I don't know, I just... You, you never want to get jaded to human beings, and it's good to take a step back and really, you know, re reassess or just keep yourself in check, basically. Keep yourself yeah. in check that you're not judging people and you're being, you're, you're giving everyone the benefit of the doubt and looking them in the eye as a human and knowing that, you know, assuming that they have something to offer and that they belong. Yep. I, I would, I'm right on board with you on that. I feel like that was, that was something that maybe I'd never talked to you about, but in my time working there, I had the same experience where I, you know, dealing with that day in and day out. Um, I definitely came to a point where I just had to sort of like take a deep breath and realize that I'm dealing with a new situation and not let these stresses build up and take out what happened with someone previously on someone that had nothing to do with that situation. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. absolutely. Um, so, so changing subjects, um, I worked with Mary at the end of the time when I was working with Mary, she was very far along um, with her little girl, Zylia. And I was always impressed that, you know, she, she worked through her pregnancy. I would say, I mean, eight months, how far, I mean, I think I left uh, not eight months. Cause I moved to LA before that, but really far. I mean, definitely into my third trimester. You were um, big, I had a big old belly. <laughs> I had a big old belly. <laughs> Which working behind a counter and having to be nimble and having to be on your feet all day, I was very impressed. So I just want to know what you have to say about like what that was like, like working in a coffee shop, working in a service position and being very pregnant. Um, well, I'll, I'll start that off by saying, I think you are like the first person that I told I was pregnant, Austin. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, I remember calling, like taking, I was, I'll just give a very, very short backstory. I try to be concise. I was going to a music festival, something I did quite a bit back then. I was leaving the next day and I decided to take a pregnancy test because my moon cycle wasn't coming. And lo and behold, I took it as like a courtesy, like, haha, this is funny, just to make sure when I party all weekend that everything's okay. And I was pregnant. I was supposed to go in for a closing shift that night. I called Austin sobbing and just said, I can't talk about it right now, but I'm not coming in tonight. He's like, okay. And he could tell I sounded distressed. So Austin being the amazing supportive manager he was, like, was, you know, okay, don't come in. So I think a few days later, I came in and I think you guessed like right away. That's what yeah. that was going on. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you knew. you knew you you were around me every day. So I think you probably sensed it in every way. And um, and so um, I should say that I was with my partner who I love so much that I'm still with today. And that part was solid and beautiful. And, you know, I was so lucky that I had that going for me. But it was definitely absolutely 100 percent unplanned. Um, this is what now, like nine years ago. And um, uh, let's see. So 
once I integrated though, once I integrated that I was pregnant and it was what it was and I saw her little heartbeat and just everything kind of, I, I integrated it all and, um, and I was okay with it and I was happy. And then I continued to go to work to coffee to the people and, um, yeah. What was that like? I remember many times I was taking people's orders and like had a blood sugar moment and had to run and like stuff a muffin in my face. Like I, <laughs> I remember Laura laughing about that. Um, but it was kind of beautiful. It was kind of a beautiful experience because I was carrying my baby girl and just to echo every single thing we're talking about. I had my community uh, of Austin and all the others. And I had the hate, which I loved so much, even though, you know, sometimes I didn't. And I just felt like, you know, it was all of that energy was infusing into Zylia. I really did. I thought, wow, this baby is going to be something miraculous because she is just being infused daily with all this mad, crazy, like hippie love from Hate Ashbury. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so I, I loved it. And I remember I'd go home and to my apartment on Hate and, Sh and uh, Schrader and and just, I was just living that experience every single day. And as I got bigger, it definitely got harder. And there's something, Austin, that you did that I will never forget that I was so happy and grateful for was you never made me clean the bathroom again. Oh, I remember really? you saying like, Mary, <laughs> like once I was pregnant, especially once I was showing a little bit, you're like, you're never cleaning that nasty ass bathroom ever again. <laughs> and I was so happy. I'm like, I could do everything, but there was something about that. And our bathroom was next level, like filth. Um, that I was so grateful for, but, um, but yeah, just being supported, like all of, by everyone, Ashley and Laura and Genevieve, and of course, Brie, my, my sister in life and, um, everybody. And just, I felt the love from, from everyone. And I loved it. I love that my daughter is infused with all of, all of those people and feelings. And, and I also felt like she would know their voices after that. I always I felt like. Because Mary and I opened um, every morning together, and uh, a lot of mornings, I feel like when I think of opening there, I feel like it was you and I a lot of times, and um, yeah. and so I felt like our five in the morning conversations now, like Zylea was listening in. I always had that <laughs> feeling. Um, <laughs> You're like, we better be careful what we say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> say something like, important. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I, and just to just to let everybody, like you mentioned, Bree. Um, so, um, Brie is Mary's cousin mm -hmm. and Mary was working at coffee, the people for a while. And she was just great. She was part of the staff and everybody loved her. And, um, and then her cousin comes in to, to look for a job and somehow that seemed perfect. We <laughs> hired her and I think like having the two cousins on the staff, like helped to like make it feel more like a family somehow. Yeah. Oh God. Especially because we're Italian, and so we brought in that, like, oh, we are a family, and we eat and drink together, and we are happy. <laughs> you really, both um, of you brought it together, brought in, like, a real family energy that I think everybody kind of, like, uh, got got a little part of. So that was, yeah, that was amazing. So shout out to Brie. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's true, and I'm just right now to my shout out. Yeah, I love you so much, and Brie killing it. Um yeah, I just love her so much. And I love that we share coffee to the people together. It honestly makes our bond, which is already a sister bond. Um, it's just even deeper. Like we share, we talk about this thing all the time, this entity, this coffee to people. And it's like, I'm so, so happy that we share it. I love Ho that. Hopefully we can have Brie on here someday too. Brie, yeah. um, Brie left yeah. um, <laughs> around the same time as Mary and also... Um, became pregnant <laughs> and um mm -hmm. and so uh so they have uh little girls that are roughly the same age mary's uh, how much older xylia is just over a year older than um viola but they are little soul sisters as well so our little family just like doubled of um little kujina goddesses <laughs> So after you left, um, so Mary went through the through the pregnancy. Towards the end, decided to move back and be closer to family down in SoCal, um, where she is to this day. And what did you do after you got back? Like, what what did you you know? Obviously, you went through you know having um, having Zylia and and raising her through the first year of her life. What did you do uh, for work after that? Because you didn't go straight back into coffee, right? I did not. So I did coffee at Coffee the People with you guys for years. And then I came to LA. I 
had Xylia. Um, and when she was close to a year old is when I really um, got heavy into the yoga world. Um, I started practicing yoga in San Francisco at a little studio on Stanion, right intersecting with hate. And um, it became a passion for me and I loved it so much. I would go, I don't even know if you remember that Austin, but I would go almost every day after work, even if I had woken up at like four in the morning. Um, and so I did yoga all throughout my pregnancy. I started working at a yoga studio um, a year after Xylia was born. And um, then I went through my yoga teacher training and I proceeded to teach yoga at a few different studios for, um, for a while, for a few years. And I'd say that was about 2011, the end of 2011 to like 2015, maybe. Um, and I was in yoga world. And then I honestly just got sick of teaching yoga. <laughs> Quite frankly, I was over it. Um, I don't know. I don't want to say anything that'll offend anybody. Yoga is one of my favorite, most beautiful things to this day, but I just got sick of the yoga industry and the yoga world and knew that if I wanted to make any money at all, just to simply support my family, um, it was just going to take a lot of things I didn't want to do as a yogi. And so I really got over it. Um, it just wasn't for me that path of, of what you have to do. Um, and so I was a yoga teacher and I thought, what if I get back into coffee? And I was like, my ego was kind of going like, okay, but you're kind of known in the community that you teach yoga. And then what is it going to look like? And how is it going to unfold to now go and say, I'm a barista again. And there was a part of my ego that is so incredibly different now, which I'll get into later, but, um, that they didn't like that. I felt like, okay, but I'm going to do it. I just felt pulled. Like I'm going to, I'm going to be a barista again. And I'm frankly not enjoying showing up to teach yoga at all. I'm sick of it. Um, so, and I also wasn't making any money at all. <laughs> did you, did you miss doing coffee or was it like, you just felt like that was the more financially responsible thing to do? Um, it was kind of everything. Like I wasn't getting, I knew that it didn't feel right to teach yoga anymore at that time. Um, I, I knew I wasn't ever going to have coffee to the people and that sort of, you know, it could be beautiful, but it would be different. Um, and I, I, that's what I did. Like I had a lot of experience in, in coffee. So I thought if I'm going to get like a job, I should just go to coffee. So I actually got a job at Phil's coffee, which opened shop in LA, which was only a Bay area thing for a while. And, um, and so I started at Phil's and I think 20, 2015, or the end of 2014. And, um, and Phil's was a whole new world because there's no espresso at Phil's. So I was doing pour overs. I was just doing pour over, pour over all day, grinding beans, one at a time. And, um, Phil's was really, really interesting. It was, we, it was a shocker after working at coffee to the people. It was so different. Like I didn't feel like I, I've, I had a couple people I really vibed with, but in general, I just didn't really vibe with the community, nothing against them, but it was just so incredibly different than what I was used to. And, um, it was just different. It was in Santa Monica. It was just a different vibe. And, and, and I just wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't really gelling. I could tell it wasn't going to be like coffee to the people where I was there for three or four years. I was just kind of chugging along and, you know, I don't know. It just, after about a little less than a year, I decided, okay, I'm putting my two weeks in here. Um, I also was trying to grow a little bit within the company and it wasn't really happening. And I was just, it was stagnant. It was dead. It, it the flow was gone. Um, so while I love drinking their coffee because it's so delicious, um, I left and I got a retail job as an assistant manager at an amazing store. And that was a whole new sort of skill set I brought in, um, I used my customer service from coffee, but I was going to be assistant managing. It was awesome to get manager experience, which I loved. I worked there for three and a half years. Um, and, and what kind of, uh, what kind of retail joint was it? Um, okay. Sell? It's, it's a, it's a really funky eclectic shop. They sell like books. It's Borough. We have locations. I still say we, they have locations, um, four different locations around LA. One's in Venice. Um, so they sell books and clothes and just funky little wares. And, um, it actually ended up being a beautiful thing. I met two incredible humans once again, um, that I'm still deep, deep friends with and, um, gained a lot of more experience, manager experience and P 
people experience, but um, I had Shanti, my second one, my second little girl, and it was time to move on <laughs> once again. Um, so after three and a half years there, um, I, I left and I wasn't working anymore because I had Shanti, um, who's now 18 months old, my second little girl, second little one. Which I haven't met yet. Who well, you haven't met, but you have to. She's amazing. Yeah. Um, so now I'm mommy, mama-ing, uh, two little ones. And once again, it's time to get a job. It's time to get another job. And, and I'm almost done with this long winded story of my, what I've been doing. Um, but something came over me like a few months ago where I was suddenly like, I'm going to get a coffee job. And I, all the weird ego trip that I had around going back to being a barista again, I was like, no, like I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get a coffee job. Um, and I went on Craigslist, got an interview at this restaurant and, um, it, within like a day I was working there and I've been working there pretty, pretty steadily, like four days a week ever since being a barista again. And it feels really good. And so this is in a restaurant? Are you a barista in a restaurant setting? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I've been, by the way, doing lots of other funky things, which I'm sure we'll get into that I didn't mention at all, but this is more just my work history. Um, but it is way different working at a restaurant, I have to say. That was definitely like an adjustment. Being a barista in a restaurant is a whole different thing. Um and they told me that when I got there, they're like, you're going to have some adjusting to do because it's different than a coffee shop. It's extremely fast paced, our restaurant. So um, I remember getting there and being like, oh, so there's never a moment in the day where like you just stand with the other barista and like listen to Led Zeppelin and sip coffee and like shoot the <laughs> shit. <laughs> like that doesn't happen here. <laughs> I'm like, but what? We have to philosophize and stuff. Um, but yeah, so it's very fast paced. We never stop moving. It's constant, constant. Um, and, um, I mean, that's the main thing, the pace, it's a little bit different as far as the tasks. Like this is totally boring barista talk, but Austin, you know, like the pulling of the mats every night and like all the classic barista tasks, we don't have to do that stuff. So it is kind of nice. Um, but, um, I don't know. This is going off subject a little bit, but I feel like coffee, the industry has changed quite a bit since 2007. And I don't know, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting where it's gone and how meticulous it is and how it kind of feels like coffee. It's all about this exact science now, which is great. Everyone loves a good latte, but it's kind of like it's not really about the coffee shop and the community as much is what I have noticed. And I personally love the coffee shop not just like the coffee and the latte. Do you find that Austin? Um, yeah. And the place where I work now is still like a very community centered sort of place. Um, but I know that it would be different if I was working at a, I would say like, like we define ourselves as like a late second wave kind of coffee shop. So okay, it's still got so the you know old the school. Yeah. Um, and then third wave is, is we're, we're like somewhere in between, but third wave is the more exacting. Like if you go to four barrel or you go to, um, ritual or blue bottle or somewhere like that. Um, yes. where it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole different situation. Cause you're like changing, like what your, uh, espresso roast is every day. You're doing a different, different bean that you have to be able to talk about. And, um, and then there's like, you guys are probably doing like matcha and oh, almond yeah. milk and oh, yeah. blah, blah, oh, blah, yeah. everything, this and that. Do you have a yeah. lot of choices? Uh, Cause there's two kind of third wave. There's like the more like you have all the choices before you, you have like all the different milk alternatives, you have matcha, you have this and that, you know, you're making all kinds of different concoctions, like mm -hmm. to very specific diets, or there's the very stripped down, very, um, you know, there's very few selections and the bean is just all that matters. Yes. So which one yes. would you say is, is your, your, um, ours is, somewhere in between. So I would say we do not have decaf, by the way, which I love. We do not have any syrups, which I love, um, except for house-made, like simple house-made honey syrup, um, stuff like that. But um, we do have almond milk. We do have oat milk. Um, we do do some mochas and things like that. It's still very simple, but it's not that I know exactly what you're talking about that. Like we have a latte, we have a cap, we have a macchiato, like done. Like we're not like that. 
but um, we do, you know, we do, uh, we don't have syrups and stuff. So we're very third wave in that way. And, and I, you know, it's great to get an espresso shot to pull perfectly and taste great. And I'm all about it, but it's like, I don't know. I feel like coffee shops are going more in that direction of just kind of that like hoity toity, like, are you even good enough to be here and like pull the perfect shot and all that. And it's just like, like, I love community and, and that's what a coffee shop's about. Make a good cup of Joe. But like, sometimes if it's just that diner coffee in a white cup, like, you know, it's like, that's good enough for me sometimes. I just love coffee shops. And, and the social aspect is, is very much a skill, you know, mm -hmm. just like pulling a perfect shot, like, like, cultivating that that social atmosphere is is a skill that you develop over time and a lot of people don't get it right at first it takes some practice and you know you like even like dealing with like we were talking about before like dealing with um a lot of the transient people and the hate that was part of us learning how to deal and adapt to the community that we were serving and learning how to to do that takes time and, and you kind of have to relearn it with every different community that you're in like mm -hmm. you know doing that in Santa Monica is going to be very different from doing it in the Haight-Ashbury and you're like mm -hmm. acclimating to the ways of uh, of a different whole set different culture yes absolutely absolutely um it's a very interesting thing working in Venice and seeing the I'm digressing a tiny bit but also the like juxtaposition of you've got like major homeless crisis right now in, in uh, Venice, major, I mean, crazier than anything I've ever seen. And I was born and raised in Los Angeles. And then you've got like a super wealthy, um, it's kind of like what you were mentioning before with the hate, but it's even much more extreme, much right. more extreme than anything I saw in the hate as far as that like dichotomy of the two goes. So it's really interesting. And I observe and as you know, I'm older than I was when I worked at Coffee to the People. So I just, you know, I observe and just take it all in and do my thing. But, um, but yeah, and you, definitely you've also mentioned, and I don't know how much you're able to get into this, but you've also mentioned that you guys kind of have a celebrity clientele where you work right now. We, we do, we do. Um, honestly, it's, it's pretty wild. We have a very large celebrity clientele. Um, so that's kind of fun. Like suddenly I become a runner that like brings the drinks to everybody when it's somebody that I want to serve. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, that kind of makes it fun. I'm not a super like starstruck kind of person, but I, it definitely makes it fun to look up and say, Oh, there's, you know, someone. So, um, so yeah, it kind of feels, it's interesting that I landed at this place, this specific restaurant. It's a pretty, pretty, um, it's, it's on the map, this restaurant for sure. And it's kind of interesting how I landed there, how it happened, how I just felt like I want to do coffee again. And it all just came together so fast and I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. It's not coffee to the people, of course, but I'm, I'm enjoying it more for my own, not so much like I have a big community there, but it's just what I'm kind of where I'm at in my life. I'm really, it's working for me. So, um, so we've talked a lot about, about work and, um, and so I, I just, before we, before we wrap this up, like I wanted to talk a little bit about your non-work life passions. Um, cause I know that you're a very passionate person and I know that you have a lot of interests that go outside of work, even though you're a Virgo. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Three Virgos here. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, Virgo. Shit's power. about to explode with three Virgos together. Three Virgos together. We are going to talk about work a lot, but there are things outside of work. <laughs> <in life. laughs> God, I love work. Um, yeah, I would love to brush over um, a little bit my passions. Um, I am very passionate. Austin knows this. We're both passionate people, and. Um, I, there's a few things and they're all braided together. Even my barista job is really braided into this. And because I'm a Virgo, I'll be tying work back into my passions, but, um, <laughs> I'm on the plant path and it's really beautiful. And, um, a couple of years ago, I followed kind of my passion of plants and herbs and well-being and nourishment. And I, I went to herb school and I did this beautiful plant spirit medicine apprenticeship that lasted a year. And ever since then, um, my life has really changed in such a beautiful way. I mean, I've, I've loved my life always and it's always gone the trajectory it should, but, um, bringing the plants in as my allies and working with plants and teas every day, it really 
um, it really just rooted and grounded my life in a way I, I didn't know was possible. And um, the most beautiful thing about it is that I've come to this big realization upon getting this coffee shop or this restaurant job a few months ago um, that it's perfectly beautiful and powerful and magical and okay to just be a barista. I think I was on this sort of trip that like I had to get this job that was impressive and whatever. And now I'm like, I'm a barista and I love it. And I brew coffee. I'm a witch and I get to brew every single day. Like, yes, this is amazing. Um, and so the plant path really helped me just root into that idea that like every moment is sacred and every part of my day is a ritual. And my morning coffee is my, one of my most sacred rituals. And like to be in a position where I just make coffee and, and serve people and do that is, is great. And I don't need more than that to feel fulfillment at all. Like, I'm not saying I'm going to be a barista forever, but I'm, I'm freer than I've ever been in my life because I really released all this imaginary pressure on myself and I feel great. Um, and powerful and magical being a barista and doing everything I do and working with herbs and plants. Um, and as well as being a barista, I have a side business, um, as a folk herbalist. And what I do is, um, take my passion for the plants and I work with other people that want to do the same. So I do, um, consultations or I call them plant sessions where I work with people and I pair them up according to what they're, what they're going through, what their situation is with a plant to work with for 30 days and kind of help them create plant communication and um, and have them imbibe uh, a tea for 30 days straight and we work together and um, and help them just root into ritual and and find like everything I'm talking about kind of find contentment and feel good and feel connected to the planet um, okay um, and so, the other so part of that Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to interject a question just, yeah, just to yeah. um, kind of make it a little bit more clear what you're talking about. So pretend that I am a person with a particular need and you are mm -hmm. my herbalist doctor. How do you <laughs> handle First of all, let's make up an imaginary, like what would I come to you for? Okay. Let's say you're coming to me because um, you have, it could be something uh, very straightforward and physical. Like I have really hard time with my digestion and I, I can't go to the bathroom. Okay, let's stop there. So okay. yes. Okay. So I'm either incontinent or I can't go to the bathroom. Um, okay. What, what would, what would you do for me? So um, what would happen is I'm going to have you fill out an intake form and it's, it just can't possibly be as simple as that. What you just said, like, Oh, I have this problem. What are you going to do for me? Because uh -huh. the more I read somebody's intake form, there are layers, there are energetic things and emotional things that are layering in with the physical things. And, um, my intake form, for example, goes over all of that. And I am no kind of doctor, but I work at all. I want a disclaimer. It is more that um, I share my passion and we work with very safe teas that I'm very comfortable having people work with. And we come up with a plan and it really is never just a physical symptom. Every single time I've ever talked to anyone, it's kind of this, this overall um, picture and it's about nourishing wholeness. It's, it's all about, it's not about restrictions. It's not about you have to take this out of your diet. You have to quit smoking. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's nothing about that. I'm not about taking away and eliminating and um, restricting. It's not about restricting. It's about what can we add in. Even if you're going to keep smoking cigarettes every day and you're going to keep eating fast food every day, no judgment. Keep doing that if that's. But let's add in this plant every day, this herb, this tea, and see how that changes things or how that integrates in with with your lifestyle. Um, because something I cannot stand about the modern health movement, because I've been through so many different kinds and and trends and everything is this idea of restriction or judging someone um, or saying, you can't do that. I can't eat this. I can't do that. It's, it's the opposite of that. It's like, what can we just add into the whole picture? You can keep doing everything you're doing. You don't have to take away anything you're doing at all. Keep doing it. But let's just add this in and see if that changes things or makes you feel more whole. Um, does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So the other piece of that is my absolute passion is is doing ancestral healing and ancestral work. And that kind of weaves in with when I'm working with people, if they want to add that piece in and they're interested in working with their ancestors or creating an ancestor practice, devotional practice, that is part of it. And a lot of people see that I do that and they do want to do that. 
Um, I have an Italian background from both my mom and my dad, and I'm absolutely just devoted to being in communion with my ancestors and um, being just present with um, with the culture and as many ways as I can in 2020 as a modern woman. Um, how can I just be in communion with them and um, invoke what's been inside of my own body for thousands of years, which is the same practices and foods. And right now I have a tomato sauce simmering, which I started before we, <laughs> before we got on the call. Um, but that's, that's my passion. And it's really simple. Honestly, my passions involve walking to my ancestor altar every day and lighting candles and placing offerings and checking in with a prayer and doing my work as a barista. And, um, you know, it's very, and I've come to this point in my life where I just love, love my, my simple rituals and it's all I need to feel completely worthy and like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing in this life. It's real. I feel very fulfilled in that. Wow. Thank you for that. Of course. <laughs> Do I still have you or did I lose everybody? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just, I was just letting it sink in for a minute. Um, yeah. So I didn't want to, I, I want yeah. to make sure that you had said everything that you wanted to say about it. Cause I'm, and that's how I, you have to handle Virgos. You have to give them their space for, all of their goings on and their passions. Like we need that space. Yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. And, um, you know, I said it a million times, but I'll say it one more time just to ground it in is just, um, really arriving at a freedom recently, um, in life and how this kind of random barista job that has now fully pulled me back into coffee has kind of been a symbol of my freedom of knowing that, that everything I'm doing is absolutely worth something and wonderful. And I don't need to do anything to prove myself or, you know, it's, it's okay if I'm not um, a lawyer or a doctor, basically. <laughs> it cares? is so okay. Who cares? It is so okay. <laughs> so okay. Yes. Liberation. Yes. Liberation. Yes. It's good when you get to that point too. I mean, there, you know, especially yeah. when you start to get in your late twenties and you start to really like question, like you realize like you've chosen a direction you've probably chosen it because of who you are and what your passions are. And then mm -hmm. you, when you, when you start to really face up that voice that tells you that what you've done is not enough or who you are is not enough. And you have to, you have to look and accept who you are. Cause you, at that yeah. point you, you own you. Exactly. Well, and the three of us are all like extremely talented, bright, energetic, passionate people, right? And like you were saying, when you got hired for your first coffee job, you don't know how to make coffee, but you know you can learn. Like mm -hmm. when you're that kind of person and the world tells you what's normal and successful is becoming a doctor and a lawyer, like you don't really have a lot of excuses because you're capable. It's not like, well, I'll never finish it or maybe I'm not smart enough. Like those, uh, those, are, those excuses are off the table. And then you yes. really have to wrestle with, like, is that what I want to be doing? And is is that the best use of my limited time here? And am I serving exactly. my community thoroughly? And when you ask those questions, then more often than not, you end up in a way more interesting field than, you know, lawyering or doctoring. Not that there aren't ways to do that in a fascinating, compassionate way. Oh, of course. It, yeah. Of there's course. just a you know million other things you can do. I think part of my um, maybe pressure I was putting on myself for so many years also is that I, I started having my kids, and as I said, unexpectedly, very young. So I think when I got pregnant with Xylia when I was 22, there was sort of this pressure, like I, I had my kid and that took up a lot of my time. And then when I'm sitting here going, okay, what do I do now? It's kind of, I kind of felt like, do I have to play catch up with trying to figure it all out? Um, you know, and I think that was a big part of, of the sort of pressure I put on myself or um, this idea that like, while well, everybody else is kind of getting it together. I'm like, OK, I'm raising this little girl and now I got to figure it out. And that was sort of a big factor in why I was putting this sort of pressure on myself all the time. And, you know, again, uh, overachieving Virgo, it's like having a child is not enough. I need to show more to the world. <laughs> When that is such an important thing, child rearing is such an important thing. You're literally creating the community that we're all living in. Yes. Yes. So yeah. Mary, if you would like, and I, you know, you may, you may not want to use this platform for that or you may, um, but, uh, but I do want to give you an opportunity to, uh, 
to let us know um, how someone would get in touch with you about your services if you if you Absolutely. would like to do that. Yeah, I would love to. If that resonates with anybody, anything that I said, um, you can find me. It's very easy because it's just my full name, uh, MaryDLorenzoWoods.com. Um, and you can also find me on Instagram. My handle is Mary DiLorenzo Woods. Um, no dash, obviously, in the handle, but it's my website and my handle, no dash, Mary DiLorenzo Woods. Um, and yes, as you said earlier, Jody, my name is a little, it's a little long, but what can you do? It's fabulous. And uh, we always wrap up every episode um, by asking you what are your favorite three coffee shops in the world? Um, whether that be places that are still operating or places that you've been in the past for any kind of reason, it doesn't have to be the best coffee that you ever had, but yeah. just your three favorite joints. Okay. Okay. This is awesome. Um, my first one is coffee to the people. Yeah. <laughs> coffee to the people. Um, I have to say we always served fair trade, organic, really good coffee on top of being an amazing community hub. Um, my second favorite, I'm going to say, is no longer there, also on Hate Street, Rockin' Java, because it's where I met my husband, who was a fellow barista on Hate Street at a different coffee shop. So that's another, that's a fun story for another day, but I have to always show my love to Rockin' Java, because it was one fateful day I walked in there, because I didn't feel like going into coffee to the people on my day off. <laughs> um, and, we all have that spot. <laughs> yeah. All baristas yeah, right? have that spot. All baristas have that spot. Um, yeah. My third one, this, I'm kind of throwing a little random one out there, but um, when I was a teenager, I used to go to a uh, Jewish deli type place in LA called Jerry's Famous Deli. And there's still a few of them, but the one I would go to isn't there anymore. And um, it was way too expensive. It frankly had pretty bad service and the food wasn't that good. So <laughs> there's that trifecta, but, um, my friends and I would sit there and, um, for hours after school, we'd go straight from school to Jerry's every day. We'd sit at a table outside. We'd drink endless cups of coffee out of the white diner cups and we'd smoke cigarettes and we would, <laughs> just talk or we would, you know, read or draw some of my artist friends. And that was just something special also in my life. And it really just kind of started my love of coffee shops and community and just this idea that you're just so incredibly entertained by going somewhere every single day and having coffee and talking and hashing it out. And a different cast of characters would show up every day from my school. Um, and it, it was a real, it was a really another another beautiful time in life and highlights my love of coffee shops. Um, my place like that was the waffle house. <laughs> yes. Did you <laughs> the same thing? <laughs> yeah, I had that. I had that, but it was the waffle house. <laughs> so the overpriced part. No, <laughs> it was probably yeah. like 52 cents for a cup of coffee or something. Oh, that's amazing. No, we would drink yeah. so much coffee. It was crazy. Well, Mary, I just want to let you know how, how much I appreciate you taking the time out to hang out with us today. It's been really great hearing your perspective on everything and, and, and learning how you felt about the Coffee to the People time so many years removed from it. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's honestly so fun, and I love any opportunity to reflect on what an amazing, incredible time that was, and I love you so much, Austin. I love you. As Have a good night. Do. Well, as we wrap up this episode, we again want to thank Mary for being with us today and thank all you listeners for joining us too. We want to hear from you guys. So if you know a barista or a coffee industry expert who needs to be featured on our show, write to us and tell us. If you got questions about coffee, send us those too. Our email address is info, I-N-F-O, at baristaunfiltered.com. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. We're getting closer to that subscriber girl on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed to us yet on YouTube, get on over there and do that. Um, if you want to write up a thoughtful review, head over to Apple's iTunes podcast app. And that helps us get found by other people. We've had a huge break here. You know, we haven't been making podcasts for, I don't know, a month or two. And we, we're just surprised people keep listening. So every week we get um, a list that says, oh, another 50 people listen to your podcast. So 
We appreciate you guys being out there. We really do. And we and just don't give up on us because we're going to keep value. putting them out. Yeah. If, well, if we're going to keep for doing a while, it. Yeah. We're, we're still here. We're still here. Yeah. Don't give up. <laughs> um, we've got some podcast patrons we want to thank. Thank you guys so much for supporting us every month. And if you want to donate to the podcast, any amount's great. And the website is patreon.com slash barista unfiltered. All right. I think that's it. I'm Jody Lee. And I'm Austin Miller. Y'all be good and stay caffeinated, friends. Bye. Bye. Bye.